some of us need to learn it from others how to be strong how to face every danger that comes across our path join us friends to welcome a wonderful person joining us all the way from chennai an experienced professional a person connected with learning development training etc join us to welcome daniel jacob he is here with us we'll get to know more about his journey and celebrate his life today on the international fab talks hello sir and welcome to the session thank you ma'am it's nice being with you on this talk thank you very much sir thank you so much for accepting the invitation thank you for being flexible and accommodating thank you very much i go ahead and share your profile and we begin the session sir yes ma'am yes ma'am thank you very much friends as i earlier mentioned we have with us mr daniel jacob he's here with us he is a wonderful writer apart from that connected with training learning development and improving the skill set of all the people he comes in contact with he's been dealing with several organizations in the right way he is the director of learning and development the milt way we'll get to know what is that the milt way i'll add more to sir's profile now daniel jacob sir is here with us he has a close association with lots of people with regard to transforming their lives and thought process and bringing out the best in them especially on the professional zone he has close to 3 decades of experience conducting various workshops seminars training interventions on self development managerial leadership and selling skills that's great i think once you able to manage things you are able to lead people and of course selling skills are very important in today's world you have to have that and sir is very connected with that and enhancing your skills and making you rise above and all this is based on good evidence and proper connection with you know behavioral science it has some scientific backing to it that's really nice it's just not just a simple session it has a scientific backing that's really nice connected with behavioral science sir has also been recognized by harvard business publishing and hyderabad and madras management association of milt training that is aparush acharya the founder of milt training foundation a world renowned trainer how nice to be directly trained by the the main founder you know the father of this beautiful training organization that's really wonderful and sir is actively connected and conducting mlc that is milit leadership courses in five centers in bengaluru chennai kolkata mumbai and pune as well sir has designed and developed several online live peak performance workshops or you could say this live peak performer workshops that is ppw peak performer workshop that's really nice a personal developing program and has trained global participants i will definitely focus on this sales pro that's really nice connecting understanding and motivating people a book on developing interpersonal relationship collaborating and working as a team that's another beautiful book insightful living containing 60 short articles on important facets of life that's really great and strength of emotional competence this is the need of the hour for each one of us either you're a professional or a homemaker or a business person or whatever you are you just need the strength to understand your own emotions and to be emotional competent so strength of emotional competence is another beautiful book understanding the three dimensions self others and situations of relationship that's really really awesome sir that's great i'd like to add a little more to sir's profile if i should not i should not skip it off i should be able to put that also in place as a social socially responsible person as sir says it's the social responsibility he has conducted several workshops for the police force prison inmates senior citizens underprivileged children and economically challenged students and working professionals as well that's really nice to give your part to the, the people who really need it there are people who could afford your services but there are some people who really require it at the right time and if you stand there as a guiding agent for them or a guardian angel that would be really nice and sir is one of them sir has a beautiful passion and dedication and has made all his training sessions very effective and empowering resulting in human potential development having set out to make a positive difference and impact in people's lives he believes in giving his very best which results in getting the best out of every participant and this is how sir's workshop goes on he is none other than daniel jacob he is here with us let's get to know more about his journey and celebrate his journey today on the international fabrics 
dear sir, that's a wonderful profile that you have. You've almost, uh, you know, connected with several people over the past three decades. That's really nice. How would you define yourself? People would love to hear it from you. Who is the real Daniel Jacob? Well, um, thanks, um, ma'am, for having me on your show. Uh, how would I would define myself? I'm a guy who's full of passion, who wants to do justice to human life. I know the life on this planet is very short, and I don't want to waste a single bit of it on vain things and try to be as much paying attention to what I'm doing. So when I say wasting time, it's not about only working and working and working. Probably whatever you're doing, if you can pay total attention to it, you are using your life. So here I'm talking to you, it's using my time. Tomorrow I might be taking a walk in the park, I'm paying attention, I might be resting, I'm paying attention to it. So therefore, when I say using time, it's not become workaholic. See, you must understand workaholic and alcoholic is one and the same. An alcoholic is addicted to alcohol, a workaholic is addicted to work. And both are all in the place, they, they are compulsively driven. And I wish to not to be a person who is compulsively driven, I like to live life spontaneously. I like to have everything what I want and I would like to work for it and get it. And uh, that would be my purpose and passion is to expand myself, my understanding and really tap into my intelligence. That's really nice. I like the way you put it, spontaneous living. You know, don't be a workaholic or a alcoholic. Worst that is, a workaholic also is quite dangerous because you miss out on your family part. You miss out on connecting with people if you're only connected with work. And that doesn't make sense. That's really nice to have a wonderful life. You know, you should be very creative in your mind and be able to guide yourself in the right way. Now, sir, I'd like you to speak about emotional intelligence before we go on to the further aspects of life and your profession. Right now, as you rightly said, when you read my profile, you said this emotional sting is the need of the I really appreciate that you saw something deeper into it because emotions are a gift that is given to us. Emotions are energy. We talk about emotions are energy put into action. The word emotion in a very simple manner can be said as emotion, energy put into motion. Today I'm sitting and talking to you. It's because of an emotional involvement. You're interviewing me because you're emotionally involved. So therefore, emotion is a very, very important component. And very importantly, it is you and I who should be directing the emotion rather than emotions directing us. For instance, you know, there are people who become very successful, they work hard, but since they don't have the emotion in place, they get into all sorts of problems. Either they become drug addicts or probably uh, do things which become, which whatever has taken them to the top, the emotion, since they're not able to handle it properly, it brings them down totally. So therefore, I firmly uh, believe, I trust that emotions are a very important component. It's dynamic. And all we need to do is that direct our emotions, right? To go further on whatever you said, I've written this book on emotional competence as you read it. Uh, in fact, I was going through a disturbance. I'm taking a long time. Even before you ask me a question, I hope I can do that. Yes, right? please. Okay. For instance, I was in a disturbed state somewhere in 2009. I lost my nephew, Michael John, in an accident. He was just 21 years, a wonderful guy. You don't know why such things happen. Only son to my brother. And he died. I was very disturbed. And that's a point in time I was just thinking what it is. Since I was doing a lot of behavioral program, personal empowerment program, then all these philosophies or principles that I've been teaching came in very strong. That is where I started to write this book. It, earlier it was called as emotional competence. Now it is called the strength of emotional uh, strength of emotional competence. Here I've defined a concept called the relationship tripod. See, a tripod gives stability. Right now I've got a light in front of me. It's on a tripod. A camera might be on a tripod. A boat might be on a tripod. That tripod is giving stability to that object for us to use it. Similarly, there's something called this relationship tripod. The tripod has got three legs. One of the component of relationship is that, strength of relationship is that, I need to relate with myself. I need to accept myself for what I am. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything of mine, when I accept myself, I am relating with myself. I've got self-esteem. I don't have ego. A ego is a compulsive need to project to the world what you're not but I have self-esteem when I accept myself for everything that I am in. 
So the first step in that tripod is I need to relate with myself. And two is that I need to relate with others. Mind you that people are also emotional. They might be great friends with you. You probably related with them well, but just something happened and they stopped relating with you the way they relate. So here, how do you relate with others is a very important element. Today, as many problems that's happening, you're also a counselor, as I heard from you, you will find all this is happening is because they are not able to relate with others. They're too good in relating with gadgets, but they cannot relate with people. So one component that gives them a lot of hap happiness is your ability to relate with people irrespective of who they are. You can't do anything to people. At least you will know how to relate with them in spite of whatever they are. So your ability to relate with people is a very important component. And that is what was there many years back. I'm a guy from the 60s and 70s. I saw, I stayed in a street in Chennai, which is called as Kanda Sami Koil Street. And every house had a veranda. That means people come, they sit on that veranda, they're given water and they go away. That's it. So care and love was there. But today, what is there? All the houses are now fenced or probably a camera, a dog. Okay, they say, beware of dogs, but there's only one dog. Now, who are the other, who's the other dog? So therefore, here, relating with others, it's a very important component. So I relate with myself, I relate with others. Then I relate with situations. Now, situation might not go the way you want to. You and I can be prepared for this talk, but something happens, technical glitch or some calamity happens. Now, how do you handle such situations? So if you know how to relate with situations, because favorable and unfavorable moments are all a part of life, how you handle them is the art of life. So this is a component. So therefore, my book is based on that emotional relationship tripod, relating with myself, relating with others, and relating with situations. So if people can get hold of this, then they really live a great life. Though I've written a book on it, I'm still learning on emotional strength and competence. And this is something I share in all my programs and the personal development programs that I'm doing. I want to ensure that people are successful, but very importantly, know how to handle their success. Very successful people, celebrities, known so much, but the end was pathetic, isn't it? How sad. To have come to that level, it's an emotional drive, but they couldn't keep it there. So therefore, stability is very important. And I certainly work a lot on myself, on my emotions, and in the meantime, also try to convey it across to people. Excellent, sir. You've explained that very well. Towards the end, you've put it in the right way. I understand myself and my emotions and enable others also to be responsible for the emotions that they portray or maybe they show or express to put the right word. That's really very nice. Thank you so much. Now, sir, you are the director of learning and development, the Milt Way. Now, what is this all about? If you could just clear it for us. Okay. Now, Milt is an organization founded by Mr. Aparesh Acharya. Now, Aparesh Acharya was trained in the Dale Carnegie Institute and he came in 1977 to India to conduct Dale Carnegie courses. But there was this Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, FERA. Therefore, he couldn't conduct Dale Carnegie programs. So he started an institution called Magra Institute for Leadership Training. Magra is his boss, operations boss in Dale Carnegie. So in order to perpetuate his memory and gratefulness to him, he started Mil Magra Institute for Leadership Training. Now, Aparish Acharya, I need to tell that because I'm talking about Miltway. He is a man who pioneered a human potential development in this country. He did programs in Hyderabad, in uh, Chennai, Mumbai, Bangalore, and many other places, but he pioneered. Today, at that time in 77, people knew the importance of technical training, academic skill development but they never paid importance to something called a soft skills or behavioral skills, attitudinal skills. So Aparish Acharya brought in this concept where people didn't understand that. And today there are so many institutions across the country. So many of them, it's good. Everybody's doing work in their own way. But if you find the roots of all this is Aparish Acharya. So that's why I'm very glad that I met in 1988. I was a very shy, timid guy, couldn't talk on a stage. Today, everyone talk, called to talk on a stage. And I met this man in 1988 and a powerful, intensive training that I went through him transformed my life from an introverted guy, my behavior really, today I'm extroverted because of the intensive training that Apesh Sharia led me into. 14 session is, a, uh, they would say it's a boot camp. I went through that. 14 session, four hours a day, spread over uh, seven weeks. I did the program and it really impacted my life. So therefore, Apesh Sharia, I was 
trained by him as a participant in 1988. Then there's a platform called the Milt Alumni Meets. And there, that means we get to be together and we continue to stay there. And I continue to stay there in the Milt meeting. So therefore, whatever I learned, I had a platform to continue the learning. And thereafter, people saw me giving good talks. They said, Danny, you can become a trainer. And many people said, Danny, we see Aparesh Acharya in you. That was a huge compliment. Aparesh was a colossal to me, okay. I was nothing, but they said, we saw see an Aparesh in you, Danny. I said, okay, fine. And I got into training and I was recognized by Aparesh Acharya uh, to train the military leadership course. Because Aparesh's demands are very high. It's very difficult to fit his demands. But I was able to uh, meet the requirements. Thank God for that. Probably some earlier skills that I had. I probably studied in anglo Indian school. My English was good. So therefore, this was basic that was needed. And obviously, you look out for a graduate. And very importantly, I'm more people connected. When I see a person introverted, I feel connected. Because I was it. And I know this guy can come up in life. So therefore, with that passion, I was doing my programs. I was freelancing. I've traveled to Sri Lanka, across the country. I used to go, just take my bag and go. Because as a trainer, I don't need any equipment. I just need some books. And I went and conducted. Then Aprish Acharya recognized me and said, Danny, you can conduct this training program. And I went through an intensive uh, residential training, trained the trainer with them. And then I started to conduct the program. And I was doing it for a long time. Then Aprish Acharya passed away uh, just about a few months back. And uh, after his demise, uh, the people who have done MILT program are called as Miltonians. So we have decided to see how we can take this training across to the world. Now that we got the impact of MILT from 1970, 70 has been conducting and many people know the intensity of it and we want to take MILT to the world. So therefore, uh, good-minded people got together and said, let's start something called as MILT Way. So MILT Way is based on the inspirations and teachings of this legendary person called Aprishacharya. And today I am the director of learning development in the team. And in the team, we have got director training and director programs and the host of other people was supporting us. So earlier it was more of a one man uh, doing the program and Miltonians in various chapters supporting. But right now we've got a small team that is working towards taking this program. Uh, this Miltway is a four day program morning nine to five it's a thursday to sunday then after that we have got some free sessions and then they get into the alumni so here this becomes very conducive for people to do it earlier it was 14 sessions spread over seven weeks or five weeks it was too long a time so we taught something without losing the intensity to bring out a program and the milkway is precisely that gives in the intensity and adds something more than what operators said so that people can benefit and this Training, uh, training will have more trainers who might be taking this program across the world. So this is the Miltway, and Miltway is a very powerful way. Miltway is an intensive way. Miltway is an ethical way. Miltway is an honest way. A Miltonian, we say, is I'm honest, I'm sincere, I'm courageous, I'm powerful. That's what a Miltonian is. I'm honest means I'm honest to myself. It is not a declaration. This is not a resolution. It's I'm honest means I'm not declaring to you. I say, I'm honest. That's what I'm made up of. I'm sincere in my relationship. I relate with somebody not expecting anything from that person. And therefore, I've got the courage to stand for my conviction. Having all these traits, I'm powerful to empower people. That's a big story, but I was trying to put in a long and short of it. That is what this military is all about, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for explaining that very clearly. Today, I get to understand the importance of the MILT training sessions. Uh, and that's really wonderful. You put that very right. And the four-day session that you've shared and how people are even in a, they, they are even able to get some free sessions as well and then join the alumni, you said. That's really nice. Wonderful. That's beautiful. And you'll have the support of the right kind of people to take it ahead. And hats off to Apur, uh, Aparesh Acharya, if I'm getting his name right. He's done a wonderful job. Like uh, soft skills are really important. Apart from the technical skills, we need to really work on our soft skills. That will take us higher. Now, sir, you also contributed on the social front. You, you're a very social responsible person. You've been taking several sessions for the police force and other people. Now, what made you do this? What made you go out of the way and serve the society? See, basically, it's it was in me. When I see some people suffering, I feel very bad. Night when I sleep, the comforts of an AC and a comfort of a bed, my thoughts go to people in the jail. 
I mean, I've heard people come out from jail and say, what a horrible life they're leading there. I mean, it pains me. Either they did good or bad, we don't know. But they're in jail. So therefore, that social consciousness is there. So I've been, I also went to the jail to conduct programs. And I went to, I was in Pondicherry, Kalapet jail. I felt very really sad. They are good human beings. Just that moment in time, they couldn't handle the emotions. They murdered because I trained uh, life sentence prisoners. There were 44 people at that time. Probably it was 2000 or so. And out of that, 22 people are given to me. And I trained. And these people are murdered. But they are human beings. Just that they did not know how to handle their emotions. And that is one thing that drives me towards social society because I empathize with people. When somebody is hungry, I empathize. When somebody is in pain, I empathize. When somebody is suffering from inferiority complex, I'm able to connect with that person to get that person out. And I firmly trust, ma'am, uh, that is, um, for instance, uh, people make money and they have lead a lavish life and they think they are great. They have a big house, interiors done up well, they have cards, they flash their uh, jewelry. But can you think of people who don't have all this? Now, why should we? The reason is if you and I are sitting and doing an interview, it's because of society's calm. Just imagine if people are disturbed, you and I can't be sitting over here because there'll be violence across. So therefore connected to the society is very important. My trainer, Operesh Acharya, always says, what you cannot consume has to go back to the society. He says, live a swanky lifestyle. But whatever you cannot consume has to go back to the society. That was the power in which he used to uh, have the social projects and we have a project in Milt called Snehalia. And he always says, never ever think you're doing something great. And he never calls an orphanage. He says it's a home. He never calls children as orphans. He said none is orphan as long as there's a creator God there. Creator God within us. So therefore, Aprish Acharya throw in this concept and probably I, I coming from a, a, a Christian background, it was there within me and probably Aprish Acharya strengthened it. And when I heard the quote of Swami Vivekananda, I met Mother Teresa in person in 1992. I read this quote of Swami Vivekananda. I, I'm a guy, I'm a very secular guy. Okay, I go everywhere. Any religious place I go there as long as they permit me in. And I'm touched with, with the, what Swami Vivekananda said. He said, as long as there's ignorance and poverty in this world, I hold everyone responsible for having benefited from the society, but pays not the least of heed to the society. So therefore, I feel it is the responsibility of everybody to be socially conscious. What we earn, some portion of it to the deprived section. My trainer says 10% of your earning has to go to the society. 90% you keep it. Over a period of time, you give 20%, you keep 80%. Over a period of time, you give 30% and keep 70%. Over a period of time, you give 40% and keep 60%. Then 50, 50. Then 60 to the society, 40 for you. Then 70 to the society, 30 for you. Then 80 to the society, 20 for you. There should come a time in your life, he says, where 90% of your earning goes to the society and 10% is for you. Now you'll be surprised that 10% that you hold now will be many, many, many times larger than the 90% you held earlier. Because when you give, you grow. We need to have the abundant mentality. When you draw water from the well, the water comes in. But if you don't draw, it becomes stagnated. Isn't it? So therefore, I wish everybody, I've seen my friends, there are some uh, in people in milk, they might not be making big money. But the money they give to the society is humongous. I also know friends outside of Milton and other places, or even in Milton, they make all the money. But they want to flash out that, but they don't want to give to the society. So social consciousness is very important. Somebody said, uh, social work is the rent that you pay for your stay in this planet. I feel that's a, a moral responsibility, that we having what we have. And if we can spare that for the benefit of somebody, that's where we are living a human life. In Milt, Aprish says, what we can consume is pathetically low compared to what we can contribute. Our ability to consume is pathetically low compared to the ability to contribute. I probably would have had my lunch. And now having my lunch, I could work and I can probably help 100 people make uh, lunch for themselves. So therefore, as human beings, our birthright is to contribute more and consume less, produce more and consume less. So if this awareness comes in, I think this will be a beautiful planet. There'll be no greed, no selfishness. We'll all be leading a happy life if everything is there for everybody. Yes, sir.
very well explained with lots of clarity and touching the lives of the prisoners, as you've mentioned, in a span of just a few seconds, they might have been overcome with the emotions that they had within them and created a lot of chaos around them, maybe even murdered somebody. You've mentioned all of that. So if you know, so you empathize with them. And I've seen constantly you are using this word. I empathize. I empathize with people. I mean, when you undergo a lot of ups and downs, you understand that when it happens to others, even if they don't tell it to you, you just become a good observer and you observe people and you try to help them out. So that's really nice. That's very, very nice. I really like the way you put that. Very interesting. Now, sir, we go on to the next question. The next question is what are the, the I mean, like, let me put it in this way, the toughest phase in your life. What was it that was so difficult in your life, but you overcame it with lots of dignity? Um, I mean, there are lots of tough phases in my life, okay? As it is said, tough times don't last forever. Tough people do. Okay, I remember the toughness I had when I probably uh, uh, I was a very average student. Okay, I was uh, detained in sixth standard. Okay, and then six to seven promoted warning, seven to eight promoted warning, eight to nine promoted warning, nine to ten promoted with consideration. <laughs> okay, and because they said if they promote this guy, he will fail, and the percentage of the class will come down. So these are tough moments, but I came out of that. And today, uh, as you read my profile, uh, more than anything else today, I'm successful. The teachers, I mean, would probably pass remarks about me. Very, I mean, I got nothing against them, but I certainly excelled. And I'm sure they'll be happy about it. So that was a, a starting phase toughness. And the next one is I got into business. Uh, I'm a guy, um, I, got a, I, had a, I have a different birth altogether. Okay, I was born in the movie that scene. Okay, so somebody said that I might be a big businessman. So when I was studying in college, I decided to take up business. Then I got into business. Two of my partners were not economically sound. Financially, they were very big. So what I did is I invested some money. And the money, it was very difficult to come. And printing press I was having doesn't give me much money. So I brought in, borrowed a lot of money on interest. My partners opted out. And that was a tough phase. I was cycling across thinking, man, when will I become big? When will I have a, a two-wheeler? When will, All these things went into me and I was able to come through that phase as well. So therefore, when you look at these toughness, I certainly had the toughness of my uh, nephew uh, dying in an accident. And very sad to say that in 12 years later, his father died in an accident for no reason. Some fellow came and banged his vehicle behind. He was just dropping his wife and standing there. One fellow bangs and he falls back. And I see, these are some things that happened. And then we are constructing this house where I'm sitting right now, just about two years since we come in. We lived in this place for 30 odd years. And then we decided as a family to bring the building down and to construct. And as you are doing the process, it all started 2018. We got the uh, permit. And then we got into construction. The fellow who took the construction delayed it by a year. Just a portion of it. He delayed it. And that put us into financial constraints. And added to it, Corona came in. And that means work was not going on. We were staying outside. We had budgeted something. It became tough. And in the meanwhile, my brother, on July 8th, he died. And then 36th uh, of December, my mother died out of old age, no doubt. But all these things were really, uh, it was very really tough. You know, today then we had this housewarming ceremony and a prayer just about two years back. I was, I couldn't talk when I was testifying about the house. I was literally crying. Because this is a dream that these people wanted to see as a family. But those members are not there. So today, these are the tough moments. And probably, mm, I always stretch my more than what I can what I can consume when I get into uh, challenging situations. Because my mother always says, in Tamil, there's a saying, that means he will measure in his empty hand. Okay, I'll plan up big things. Then they'll ask me, where's the money? I don't tell. <laughs> so therefore, I, so I get into it. Then I face the toughness and I come out of it. So therefore, uh, not that I want to get into a tough situation, but I'm always a stretching guy. Uh, right now, you know, we still need to do certain things. And I'm going to stretch myself. My daughter would uh, <laughs> shout me for that. And my wife might. My, my son sort of uh, silently supports me. But all these are things that I've got challenges. I will not say, as you rightly put, it's not tough times. It's tough times don't last forever, but tough people do. I don't consider anything as a 
problem in life, I consider them as challenges in life. Problem means a situation you feel is overwhelming. Challenges, you know there's an overwhelming situation, but you have the resources to fight it. So therefore, I try to harness all the resources. And one important dimension, ma'am, I want to mention is one needs to be spiritually tuned. The moment you're spiritually tuned, you're not identifying yourself with your body and mind. And the moment you have the clarity that you're not just a human being, you're a spiritual being in a human form, then it makes all the difference. So therefore, uh, I am, uh, since my upbringing and many things that happen, I'm very spiritually tuned. I'm not a religious guy. I don't go to place of worship like the way what everybody does on a Sunday. But I'm probably doing what I want to do. So therefore, I'm not a religious guy. I'm a spiritual guy. So spiritual tuning is very important. But many people misunderstand spirituality to be religious and they become religious and they become ritualistic and therefore they cage themselves. Spirituality is about breaking the religion and experiencing the freedom. And that is the purpose of religion. The word religion is taken from two Latin words, re legere, which means to unite. So religion should help you to unite with the source, spirituality. But if the religion tries to keep you caged, confine you, you got to be careful to get out of it. And I have got of it, out of it. And I'm living a, a life that is freedom. Because what's the point of being a bird in a cage? when you can fly in the vast skies. And when you fly in the vast skies, there are danger. But yet, that's what the bird is meant for. And that's what we human beings are meant for. Yes, sir. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm glad that you opened up like a wonderful book about all the problems that you've been facing. We'll not use the word problems. Now I'm going to change it to challenges. The challenges that you faced in life on the personal front, especially you shared that wonderfully. That's really nice. That, I mean, it would really help others also to relate to what you've shared. And what people assume, you see, sir, the thing, the sad point is many of them assume, oh, Daniel may be fine or XYZ may be fine, but they do not know the real pain and suffering that one has endured or is enduring. On the, uh, I mean, just when they look at you or they see that you're smiling and all, they think that everything is fine, is going good for you. But the truth is, uh, like each one of us have all our tough battles to fight. And when we fight our battles in the right way, we emerge victorious. So you're like a phoenix risen uh, from the ashes. That's wonderful, sir. See, yeah. I'm a very talkative guy, okay? And my talking, people take it for granted. I socialize and they think this guy looks insignificant because I mean, I don't have to carry yourself everywhere, no? And who, whoever knows me, they know I'm talkative or playful, they know Danny is a trainer, he's a mentor and all that. So they look at me from that background. But that is not there in other places, you know? So, but what I always keep in mind is that my smiling and my being playful don't take it for weakness. Very true. Your kindness should not be taken for weakness. And I, when I know they're taking my kindness for granted, then I know how to put myself up and show my rupam, rupam, okay. Now, just not being arrogant, just that, you know, sometimes you need to convey things across to them and that's the thing. And if you're taken for granted and that's the time you need to show who you are. Yes. True. Very true. Thank you for that. Thank you for making us aware about how to stay safe when people begin to take you for granted or take you lightly. You know, you have to draw that boundary or keep them out of that zone and not allow them to poison your life or your profession, it could be, or anything. Because I've also faced that, what you shared. I could really resonate with what you shared. They start taking advantage of you when you're very kind, when you're very soft. That's right. That's wonderful, sir. Now, sir, what about the bulletproof manager? What is this all about? It some, sounds very, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, magical yeah. or something, maybe. I don't know. What is it? If you could share that with us, it's really nice. See, I, I got into training. Somehow, I like liked it. I might be sick, but when I get into a platform to train, uh, my energy comes out. So I was doing uh, freelancing, then I got into Milt Aprishacharya. Then in 2006, I fell out to the Aprishacharya, whom you admire, whom you you uh, you consider as everything. You, you saw always that to me, but something happened that I fell away from him. After 16 years of close association, I decided like the way I told you, I, you can't take me for granted. I said, man, forget it. Uh, if at all I'm destined to do well, I will do. And I took a call to get out of milk, which is a tough decision because I've been in the forum for some time. And that's a time one of my friends called me and said, Danny, there is this uh, uh, organization called uh, Crestcom International. It's an international organization and they conduct a bulletproof manager program. 
and it is being led by uh, um, uh, Crest Point in Chennai. Okay, there are franchise there. Uh, one uh, Naresh uh, Purshottam and uh, Lakshmi Kirti Vasan. Now these people took me in. Uh, here in Milt, I was a trainer. You are very hard as a trainer. You, you, they have to do what you tell them to do. It's as simple as that. There's no asking permission from them. But whereas a bulletproof manager is facilitating, that means we are with the participants. I might know, but as a facilitator, I ask question and get the answers from them. It's I play the role that I don't know much and it's like getting the answer from them. So here I was facilitating. So this Bulletproof Manager program uh, is from Crestcom International. It's based out of um, Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, very important, I was working for New Nuveda or Crest Point Consultants over here. And it's a program for senior managers, okay? Uh, see, earlier you said about me being Harvard Business Publishing, stepping up to manager. And now this is for senior managers, where all these competence are given to them so that they were a bulletproof. Okay. Literally, it's only, uh, what to say, allegorical bulletproof, where they wear a bulletproof so that whatever is being fired on them, they're able to take it. That's the significance of this name. But very importantly, it's a program for senior managers so that they can handle the challenges of their managerial a role that they go through. So this is the Bulletproof Manager program. I facilitated the program across the country and it was a great opportunity for them from being a trainer, okay? And I got into the role of a facilitator. So I was able to develop two skills. So I know how to be hard as a trainer and how to be soft as a facilitator. Now with this training background and the facilitation, today I'm a trainer facilitator kind. When I go do a facilitation, I'm a little bit of my training also comes in because trainer it has to hit it hard. Okay, hit it hard in a manner, they accept it. They don't take it for granted. But total facilitation is something, it just goes very soft. So with this training background, I'm able to do my facilitation also well. So that's what is about the Bulletproof Manager, ma'am. That's excellent. That's really nice. A beautiful way to share that. Now, sir, how would you want people to remember Daniel or Danny? What do you love to be called as Daniel or Danny? All right. My name is Daniel Jacob. And I'm called as Danny, okay. And uh, I, my trainer, Aprisha Chari, said, hey, Danny boy. <laughs> so I might be aged also, but the way he calls me, hey, Danny boy, even today, people call me Danny boy. I'm, I don't want to tell my age, <laughs> but also in done because this age is a problem. But young guys don't talk to me. I really know my age, okay. And I'm called as uh, Danny boy, and uh, I'm absolutely fine. Daniel Jacob being called as Danny. And in my call, in my environment, social uh, circles, I'm called as Danny. I love it that way. But it's very, very casual form. So in Crestcom, they told me you'll not be called as Danny, you'll be called as Daniel. It's more <laughs> uh, uh, nice to be called as Daniel. I said, fine. My trainer also says, that's the only good thing I have, he says. <laughs> He's a very hard guy, okay? He doesn't mince words. It's sometimes when he's casually talking. I was about to start a training uh, an organization before I could get into mill training. Then he said, uh, use your name, Danny, Daniel training. I said, operation doesn't sound nice to call Daniel. He said, that's the only good thing you have, man, <laughs> in a very casual manner, he said. But more importantly, in US, you know, uh, Tony Robbins program, Dale Carnegie program, Stephen Covey program. So why not it be Danny program? So that's how I started it as Daniel Institute, IDJ. IDJ was my earlier erstwhile institution, which is called I Daniel Jacob Associates. That's where it has come, man. You can call me Daniel, Danny, I'm game for both. <laughs> in fact, my name is DF stands for Da. In Tamil, Da means very <laughs> respect. And DN stands for Dan. And DANI stands for Danny. DANI stands for Daniel. So choice is absolute. My name is also pretty uh, dynamic, versatile. People can call me any way they want. Yes. How would you want people to remember you? One fine day we are going to leave this earth, all of us. So when it's our time to leave the world and we are gone forever, what kind of memories would you want to leave behind? In what way people should remember Daniel Jacob? Okay, people wanting to remember me is a big thinking, okay? They will forget you in a couple of years, okay, for sure, okay? Because there are life challenges for people, isn't it? 
right? If at all I want to be remembered, I would certainly really like to be remembered as a person who was jovial, fun-loving, who took up an assignment and gave his best. And he's a guy who's, uh, it's lovely to be with him. And he's, he's a life in a party. All this is what I want to be remembered as. But as I told you, uh, memory is too short and people are too very dynamic in their living. They might not remember you at all. You just become top soil over a period of time. And that's what I would become. If at all I want to be remembered, I would be remembered, like to be remembered, like what I said earlier. Yes, sir. So is there any incident that you remember with regard to your childhood? Like, were you the same happy person like you are today, like accepting everything? Of course, you might have been hurt from within. But then again, you have to put a brave front. You have to put the bulletproof on and, you know, show a happy face to everyone. As a little boy, what was your experience? Like, were you from a happy space or were you scared of connecting with people? You had any negative experience at school or at home or while going to and fro from school and to home like would you like to share any incident with us see for instance i i was a guy who was always loved i was a very chubby guy whenever my mother's colleagues come hey danny such a small boy cute boy like that i still remember that and my relatives loved me a lot somewhere they found uh, if they want to control my brother elder brother who's a tough guy they said tell danny he will take care okay so I was always the guy who was a goody, goody guy for many people. Okay, here is a guy, well, and many of my readers say it's nice to be with Danny. And I remember people talking to my daughter and son say, your father is a very lively man as a child, you know him. So therefore, uh, that is one thing that I came in, but I put on a tough posture over a period of time because I felt I was being taken for granted. Okay, so that's why I said, man, I might be goody, goody, but I'm also baddy, baddy, <laughs> okay? And... Uh, and as a child, I was, as I told you, I had a lot of complex, uh, inferiority complexes than me because I studied in a co-education school and there are certain attributes of yours which is not gelling. So I had a lot of complex. And, um, and as I told you, I couldn't even read a paragraph in my class uh, days. You know, when a book came to me, when, I, when the teacher's got nothing to do, well, the teacher would say, read one on paragraph from the textbook. 40 students read for one minute, 40 minutes gone. Teacher goes away. So when the book came to me, I went to the sir and said, sir, I can't read because I stammer. He looked at me and said, go and sit down. I went and sat down. I felt very bad. I came home. I read that book, that text. I was sounding much better. Then I found it was not stammering. It is my inferiority complex that was putting me down. So these are the times that I had and I decided to come out of it. Probably all this was bubbling within me, simmering within me. And when I got an opportunity to express myself, I exploded. And today I'm not a goody goody guy. I'm a goody goody guy who can play around, but I can also be a baddie buddy boy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing the lovely incident that at school you reminded me of my school days as well. I could also resonate with you when the teacher would ask us to read. You know, it would just shiver from inside. Could I read it? Could, you know, even I face that a lot, a lot of infer inferiority complex. Can I read it in the right way? Or are the words quite easy? And I would just pray that this is, if she is reading so-and-so line, then she, the next one, and then this is my turn mm -hmm. to read this line. So I would prepare before in hand and like, you know, it brought back my memories of my school days where the teacher would ask us to read in class. Of yeah. course, and that has really transformed us in a different way and shaped us in a, a beautiful way. Like Wonderful, anything. isn't it? When you go back, yes. look at those days and what we are right now, it's absolutely, we just laugh it off, isn't it? What we cried over a period of time, today we are laughing it off. Very That's nice. how life is, we pass on, this too will pass. Yes, and this is a message for all the other youngsters who may view this video one day or the other. What challenges we faced, you could also be facing at the moment now, but don't worry, it will just vanish away and you will really bloom in the right way absolutely yes as you said when you got the opportunities you just bloomed yes that's really now that you brought in this word opportunity uh, i mean uh, this is one definition that i share they say this person is lucky he's doing well in life he's getting all the uh, things that he wanted he said they are lucky destiny i remember getting this definition of luck from my trainer of Rishacharya. It says luck is the meeting point of your alertness and preparedness to the opportunities passing by. So there are opportunities passing by. Are you alert and prepared? You're lucky. But if an opportunity passed by, if you're not alert and prepared, 
you can always say you're unlucky. But who's responsible? Uh, alertness of your opportunity passing by. For instance, this interview with you, when I got a, from a, a call from my friend and said, Danny, there's a talk like this, he showed me his video. Would you want to take it? I said, yes. The reason is, I was alert to an opportunity pass by. Otherwise, I can always say, man, I've got 30 years of experience. What is that show about? Who are the ones who are there? I could have put all this big, big thing in there. I know. I know there are some people who might watch it. I know there are some people who might benefit from it. So I was alert. So at any point in time when you're alert, that means you see, you're an optimist, you're prepared, you have the competence, then you're lucky. Opportunity comes and you grab it. So that is what is luck. And we are responsible for our luck. Yes, you explained that very well. That's really nice. Now, so what about cooking and food? We'll leave the professional zone a little and come down to the stomach. Like, are you a person who loves good food? And if yes, are you also a person who enjoys cooking or you haven't learned the skill of cooking? I love good food, okay? <laughs> and in fact, that's one thing that... Uh... Uh, our family we do together collectively if at all one place you all go together is a restaurant i always say my wife will think south i will think north my son will think east my daughter will think west we never get together on the same page but one time we get together on the same page is to go to a restaurant okay so i certainly love food and i'm very uh, i mean uh, i i love good food simple as that whoever does it and i go gaga Wow, what a food, what a food. My wife might even say, come on, sit and eat, okay. <laughs> but if the food is not good, I silently eat it. So that's about my, my food part of it. I certainly would love to test food and uh, wherever it is, wherever I like to adjust with people and eat the food. If I eat a food which doesn't, it disturbs others, I ensure that I don't take it. That's also another important relationship component. We call it as three A's, adjust, accept and appreciate. Adjust your likes and dislikes with the other person. Uh, accept the other person as he or she is and appreciate the appreciable points of the other person. So therefore, food I love. I like to eat. And one food, what you would call is I come to Hyderabad and you know biryani. Okay. And the biryani there, Hyderabad is a place for food. I love that. And cooking. Mm, I, I think I want to learn cooking. <laughs> I probably make coffee and tea better, but I would love to. And that's one of my agenda to ensure that I do something where I can cook on myself. Because if you're a foodie, you must also know how to cook. So I think that is one thing. Next interview, I'll probably tell you I also cook this. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yes, that's really nice. Like you appreciate the food that's given to you. Even if you don't like it, you humbly eat it. And even if you're amongst different people, you know, you just bond with them and have the food that is being served there. You know, try. You know, you try to avoid any type of, uh, you know, negativity or maybe some type of indifference. Like feel one. You know, go with them, join. Them. That's really nice, and we all should be conscious, especially when we have the people who have different types of cuisines. We should be careful who is in front of us, who we are sharing our space with while having lunch or dinner or anything to eat. This is one conscious decision everyone should make to make everyone feel comfortable. I like the way you put that. Very well put in, sir. Now, sir, you as a father, as a dad, how do you feel that you've been as a fa father? Are you a very strict parent or are you flexible? Uh, I think uh, I've been a good father. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just that my profession, I, I never took a, a job. In my 30 plus years of experience, probably I worked only for five years. On a job. Otherwise, I'm consulting, I'm traveling, I'm training. I, I come to Hyderabad, I stay there, I come to Pune, I stay for a month. But I always ensured my children are doing well. Okay, I never pushed my wish onto them. For instance, let me uh, tell you this incident. My daughter, and I've been with her uh, in all the phases of her life. Like she went and joined school, LKJ was there. It so happened, in spite of me being uh, traveling, I was there in a college admission, a professional college admission. Somewhere I was able to, uh, all this came into my convenience and I was able to provide time. And then um, today, uh, I'm glad my daughter, Christina Rachel Jacob, she's a HR. Much as I am more spiritually inclined, they are also spiritually inclined and not religiously bound. And my son, Noel Jacob, uh, had a challenge challenging childhood probably he, he didn't get 
see more than he didn't get a double digit mark till his 10th standard can you imagine that some way he was promoted because i went and spoke to the teacher and then at the 10th standard even in the final preparatory he was getting single digit but somehow we knew he had some challenges we know what the challenges is and then he was he did it and he got first class in uh, 10th standard and thereafter he got first class in 12th standard and he finished his uh, graduation from lila college one of the premium colleges in uh, chennai and then he's done his postgraduate in uh, 3d animation now all this they have done and they are very independent and i'm not i don't want my children to achieve what i failed to achieve today me and my son go to badminton every day in the morning and play badminton for two hours and he's comfortable with me i'm comfortable with him but i i now now we he, he has never driven a cycle he doesn't know to drive a cycle doesn't know to drive a two wheel a two wheeler but today he's driving a car <laughs> okay and today i'm so glad when i'm not around he takes the car out and takes mom and his sister out and does work so therefore i would certainly credit myself to being a a good father and my wife of course elizabeth jacob she's been very very supportive in all my travel and all my moods and the swings that i have she's been very very adjusting otherwise it would been a catastrophe of a relationship i really i would thank her for that i love this poem from khalil gibran i don't know whether you read it on children your children are not your children they come through you not from you you can house their body but not their soul and it says you are like a bow in the archer's hand and you have to bend and your children are like living arrows and there your the archer bends you with the with the intention of setting the arrow far and further so therefore that's a beautiful poem and that poem really opened me up to know that these people have their own mind all we need to do is that till about 18 years or so give them that uh, protection and after that they can handle life my daughter probably had so many ways she could have gone haywire in manipal and other places but she didn't she couldn't because not that i told but that, that she felt so so therefore i certainly would credit myself to be a good father and also thank my wife for being a supportive role in bringing the children and today these two kids are doing well in life that's really nice wonderful sir are you mom's pet or dad's pet hmm i mean <laughs> my mom initially i i really it's my mother okay i remember as a kid you know i know when you were in school school and you're sick and mother comes i just coil on her okay and i i used to be a mummy's a guy but after marriage you know what happens okay <laughs> mummy feels he's got the wife and all that but anyway i was mom and i love my father my mom is catherine she's no more and my father a very hard working man uh, today i i go in a car every time i'm driving a car but my father went to work in a cycle and after 25 26 years he retired in the same cycle okay that is the sacrifice my dad did to what i am today i always tell my dad dad you are a good example of a bad communicator <laughs> this is what i used to say and today people praise me for my communication skills and i should really thank him because what he lacked he had allowed us to grow so therefore these are gods for me those two people my dad who passed away in the year 2000 and my mom who passed away just two years back yes sir that's i can't true. say anybody spit because i i i'm a result in this in this world because of both of them okay <laughs> yes sir. yeah what about your association with pets sir? do you love pets yeah i love pets i love pets okay but we don't grow them okay they they at home i love them for instance i had a fish and it lasted me in our house for in a tank and um, i don't know what's the name of the it was a single one my nephew who passed away he said uh, mama i want to leave this fish with you and he left it with us and probably the next day he passed away my my nephew but that fish was in a house for about 12 to 13 years we used to take care it's just that we went for a long uh, stay out and we lost that fish otherwise that was the one thing that is very very memorable so therefore if i lose a pet i feel very bad and obviously i love dogs and cats uh, and i love them and um, but i don't have any one of them i would like to probably if the facility is there in the house you know you like to have them at home otherwise right now with the space and with the neighbors it shouldn't be a disturbance that's why i don't have a pet yes yes i get that 
and I could really visualize that fish over there. Did you all name the fish or something? Did you all give it a name? No, it was Michael John, my nephew. It was every time we see him, we look at him. And that fish, you know, the moment one week or not, that suddenly it comes, you can see it uh, wagging its tail and coming near the glass. Man, it's recognized us. It sees somebody disquiet, but it knows we are calm, you know. It's sad that it has to die and probably one day it has to die. But probably I don't know whether we were a reason for it because we were not there for a week or so. Probably couldn't feed it. Very sad though. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It's been a wonderful time with you on this show. Thank you so much. Stay blessed and stay connected. We'd love to hear more of you when you share all those important one-liners. You know, I start becoming alert and wanting to listen more. And you know, it applies personally to us. We could really implement all those one-liners, uh, you know, towards the end you've shared, like, you know, God has given us this gift of life. What we make out of our lives is our gift to God, to the creator. I really love that. Thank you so much. Stay blessed and stay connected. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It is a pleasure talking to you for more than an hour. Probably I learned a lot, okay? That's why I never miss an opportunity if I'm called. I never put my uh, prize up and all that. And somebody told me there's a talk show you want to? I said, yes. Then I came and I'm so glad that I could connect with you, get to know you, and probably the listeners get to know me and I like to get to know them as well. So thanks for this opportunity. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very you, much. Stay blessed and stay in peace. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very we much. should stand by. Thank you, sir. My dear friends, we come to an end to the International Fab Talks for today. Thank you for being with us, dear friends. Share this wonderful video with the right kind of message that it has. Spread it across different platforms. You could share it in WhatsApp groups or with your friends and relatives where they could really acquire a lot, a lot to learn. With this, we'd like to sum up the session now. And don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment to the International Fab Talks. Above all, love yourself, love your family and protect the environment as well. Stay blessed. Thank you, man. Thank you so much.